Hey, tennis fans, and welcome to another edition of Matchpoint Canada, the official podcast of Tennis Canada. Our thanks for 10XTO, the official athletic club of Matchpoint Canada for this week's episode. I'm Ben Lewis, joined alongside Mike McIntyre, and we are here for our 2022 Roland Garros recap. And I I think because it's fresh in our mind, Mike, maybe we'll start on the men's side, uh, just having watched back that final. and. For me, this final with Rafael Nadal and Casper Ruud almost felt like a, a formality after his previous couple matches and, and seeing a couple of the blockbusters he survived. But sure enough, 14 French Opens, 22 Grand Slam singles titles, and uh, the King of Clay lives on. I feel like we could just go back and reuse some of our audio from one of Rafa's <laughs> previous uh, you know, 13 triumphs in Paris um, because the script has been all too familiar, especially when you've got a first-timer as your opponent in Casper Ruud and, and good for the Norwegian making it to the finals, uh, the first from his country to do so. Uh, he seemed rather content in his post-match comments. He didn't seem like he was upset or, or down on himself. It seemed more like happy to have made it to the finals versus kind of ruining his performance, only walking away with six games, which, Hey, you know what? The great Roger Federer only took four games off Rafa back in the 2008 finals. So, uh, you know, anything above that, I think, is uh, at least, uh, you know, not a, a, a note in the history books for Rude. But uh, it went according to script. It went according to the way we thought. And other than maybe at the start of the second set where it looked like Rude was going to sort of put together something and, and broke early there, uh, mm-hmm. it was really Rafa all the way. Yeah, 6-3, six, 6-3, three, six, three, six, love. And as you said, Root had a brief glimpse of hope there early second set ahead 3-1. And then uh, Rafael Nadal steamrolls the next uh, 11 service games. And I felt like he particularly raised his level in the sur- third set, just a phenomenal level of tennis. And, and we know, I think when Rafa gets to the stage, this is something we talked about, if you're going to beat him at Roland Garros, which is already basically the toughest ask in this sport, right? you have to do it before the final. He's 14 and O in the finals, just un- unbeatable when he gets to that championship match at this tournament. Uh, and look, our Canadian was the closest of anybody to, to nearly stop him. I was thinking about that. I meant to, to send sort of a, a shout out tweet to, to Felix Ogiali, a seam didn't get around to it, but he was the one that pushed him the furthest between, uh, and he had a, Look, Rafa did not have an easy way to this, this final. No. Uh, all the top 10 guys he had to beat, and, uh, and certainly Djokovic, which he did in four sets. But for Felix to be the one that, that pushed him to a fifth, um, and we've had some moments this year where we're like, wow, Felix is looking like a real you know, permanent top 10 kind of guy. Looks like he could keep it going. Uh, maybe that success at a slam is, is coming sooner rather than later. There have been moments with Felix this year as well where he's kind of gone dormant. So uh, this is just an encouraging sign to wrap up the, the clay court swing for him and something that he can really hold his head up high and, and be proud of the fact that, yeah, uh, of anyone on Rafa's quest for number 14 in Paris and number 22 overall, Felix gave him the hardest time. Yeah, absolutely. A, a thrilling five set match and, and great level. Uh, as you said, I, I think, well, the blockbuster of this tournament was that quarterfinal Novak Djokovic against Rafael Nadal meeting for a 59th career time, which is uh, staggering enough that the number of times these two rivals have, have squared off. I think they've played better matches, but I certainly think this one fit the billing. A a great four-set clash that was topsy-turvy, and Nadal has the two sets to one lead. Djokovic was up 5-2 in the fourth before uh, Rafa saved a couple set points, stormed back, and and takes that one late into the night in Paris. I think it finished at at 1 o'clock. That had more of the feeling of the final, and you can tell that celebration just getting that victory. It was almost... Like he, he climbed the biggest hurdle that he would have had to face uh, before getting, getting this trophy. Right. And you think if that match had gone the opposite way, right, Ben? Like if, if Novak had won that, then I think we pretty much say, okay, Novak's walking away with the title at that point. And that would have tied them at 21 Grand Slams apiece. So there's just so much history on the line, so much at stake with Nadal having now a two slam lead over both Federer and Djokovic. Federer, I think even his most ardent fans would say, okay, there's no way he's getting three more Grand Slams at this stage. Uh, Novak could do three slams, but that's not going to be an easy accomplishment as you have so much more competition in the top 10 and you got young guys coming along, Alcaraz, Holger Rune, who looked terrific in this tournament. It's not a given that Novak can just go out and blitz his way to three more slams. And that's not also to say that Rafa Nadal can't add a couple more to his haul as well. So I feel like getting that 22nd one 
was a big one for him. This gives him a big advantage. And uh, even though I take into account many things in my, you know, greatest of all time, boy, Rafa's, uh, you know, pretty hard to argue against him right now with, with what he continues to be able to do. Yeah, he's staking uh, quite the claim. You look at 14 French Opens. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we were just marveling in the fact that Pete Sampras had set the all-time record in majors with 14, and he's won 14 at one event. I mean, that, that's almost hard to comprehend, I, I think, for people who grew up watching the era of the 80s and 90s. and probably proclaiming at that time Pete Sampras as, as the greatest ever and and then further doing so with Roger Federer when he captured number 15 and would add to that of course and now Nadal at, at the French Open getting number 14 a few more accolades here uh 22 and 8 major finals is an unbelievable record 92 career titles so you have to think can he get to 100? That is certainly within distance. And he also is now the oldest singles champion at, at the French Open. So I, I think this guy already had enough records before this event, but he's uh, he's piling onto the list. Yeah, and and 20 years this summer it'll be since Pete Sampras's last Grand Slam win. Um, hard to believe that, that that much time has gone by. In, in my mind, anyways, I, I find that hard to believe. Uh, little side note, I want so badly for us to try and get Pete Sampras on the pod oh, that would be for, for that 20th anniversary. <laughs> and it's basically a, a, a 0% chance of it happening because he hardly talks to anybody in tennis, let alone a Canadian tennis podcast. But funny little story, I, I did, uh, you know, find his brother on Instagram and and I shamelessly sent a message reaching out that way because I don't know any other way to get to him. You know, anyone through the USTA has basically already told me. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, but anyways, <laughs> fingers crossed. You never know. It's always worth a shot. And yeah. uh, one other American I want to mention, and that's Jimmy Connors and, and how that relates to what we're talking about is I was reading Christopher Clary's book on Roger Federer the other day, which I'm kind of slowly getting through, not because it's a slow read, but because I don't want to rush through it. I want to just kind of enjoy it here and there. So I'm reading The Legend and lo and behold, on one page, it has a quote from Jimmy Connors taken from Matchpoint Canada. So our podcast made it into the book, which I thought was pretty cool. We've, we've had Christopher Clary on the podcast many times before. And uh, the quote from Jimmy Connors is in regards to how much the Grand Slam count means today versus how little or, or how much less it meant back in his day. And he was saying, you know, now the Grand Slams have taken over was, was the quote that he shared with us when we had Jimmy on the pod a couple of years ago. And that back in his day, they didn't play the Aussie Open hardly ever. Uh, he missed the French Open for several years in, a, in yep. a dispute there with the French Tennis Federation. And and only now, really, have we in this day and age with Roger and Novak and Rafa, suddenly the overall major count means so much. And in part because you've got three guys who are all doing it uh, simultaneously. So I thought that was interesting. One, the shout out that we got. And and two, what Jimmy Connor said. Be interesting to note if, if those guys, Connors, McEnroe, Borg, had played all those events back in the day, what would their overall count have been to you know yeah of course and obviously the question with Borg what happens if he doesn't retire at, at such a such an incredibly young age and he was of course dominating the French Open uh through his through his early career just wanted to to note on Nadal and of course all those injury questions coming in with the chronic foot injury I, I read this quote that he said he played with no feeling in his foot and an injection on the nerve. So the foot was essentially asleep. So if you're, if you're wondering how he managed this, and I read that basically he felt like he could barely walk after his second round match against Corentin Moutet uh, of France. So then they uh, shifted to uh, an an anesthesia, pardon me, in the foot and, and injecting it uh, to take away all the feeling there and basically make it numb so he could feel like he could run around with, without that pain. But um, I'm not sure this is something that's sustainable for him to keep pushing on. And I know this was something you were wondering, is he going to announce his retirement uh, if he wins this title? He hasn't done that, but you have to wonder, is he going to carry on just a few weeks and try out Wimbledon? Yeah, I got to be honest, the thought crossed my mind. I think it crossed some people's mind and I didn't give it huge credence that it might happen, but but a small chance that maybe if he wins it, the plan is, hey, this is how I'm going to ride out into the sunset. What greater way to go out? Yeah, He's such a fighter, such a competitor. How could he, especially after winning 3-3 in love, um, you know, how could he, I guess? So he said in his post-match comments, I don't know what can happen in the future, but I'm going to keep fighting to try to keep going. So there you go. Uh, yeah. That being said, you hope he can end his career and still have, you know, just quality of life as a, as a human being, right? Being able to walk around, 
run around one day with his little kids or little nephews and nieces, whatever the case may be. Uh, you know, it kind of harkens to me when I hear you talking about the injection in his foot. It reminds me of Agassi, who at 35 and 36 was having to get those cortisone shots in his back for his sciatic nerve more and more frequently. And, you know, at the end of his uh, last uh, U.S. Open in 06, he could barely walk. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, at what cost are these athletes uh, doing this in their, their quest, their fight? Uh, it's admirable on one hand but you just hope that they're not doing long-term damage that they're going to regret, you know, for the rest of their lives. Yeah, you, you would uh, certainly hope not. Uh, you are listening to Matchpoint Canada, the official podcast of Tennis Canada. We'll touch on a couple of the other surprises, I think, on the men's side before we shift over to the women's. Holger Rune, as you mentioned, the quarterfinal run, I don't think any of us saw that coming, though he's such a promising young teenage player from Denmark. Took out Denis Shapovalov in the first round, kept it going, and then ousted Stefano Tsitsipas in the fourth round in four sets. We thought Tsitsipas had a really nice road to maybe uh, make the final for a second consecutive year. That didn't happen. I think this, though, is even more surprising than Holger Rune. A resurgence from veteran Marin Cilic making the semifinals, and he's now been to the final four of every single Grand Slam event. And I have to admit, I think a couple of years ago, we were thinking this is sort of the end for him. Yeah, Chilich to me has cemented himself as a future Hall of Famer, although I think I would have given him that nod even if he hadn't uh, made it to the final four of every major. I think I still, when I look at his overall body of work, his grand slam in the era of the all-time greats and some of his other accomplishments, consistent presence in the top 10, I think he already probably locked it down. But this to me definitely solidifies that one. Um, so, you know, great to see from him. Uh, look, this is a guy who at Wimbledon too, maybe this is going to give him a little added confidence to say, Hey, oh, I, sure. I can still go deep at these majors. And his game is certainly one that be threatening on grass. And to touch on CC pass. One thing for me is as everyone was kind of lamenting how heavy the top half of the draw was, uh, in the men's side and saying how CC pass had it relatively easy in the bottom. I mean, first of all, that's a bit, I suppose, disrespectful to some of the great players in that bottom half, including Casper Ruud. No surprise that he had a great run amongst uh, that half of the draw. But did CC Pass maybe hear from too many people, hey, you've got a great path, no Nadal, no Djokovic, no uh, Alcaraz. And did that maybe play into his mind a little bit and just kind of soften him up and, and take away a bit of that killer edge that you need to, to go to the, uh, the, the end of a, a two-week major like this? I don't know. That's just something that crossed my mind, that perhaps it seemed a little bit too much like people were, people were, people were pardon me, mm -hmm. Uh, sort of handing it to him before the tournament even started. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, definitely a reasonable point to make that, or was he just overcome by some pressure feeling like he definitely belongs in the final, given the lighter half of the draw that that certainly could be a factor as well, but uh, credit to Norway's Casper Ruud, who I had the privilege of speaking with at the national bank open last season. I think his goal was quarterfinals and he, he uh, did it two steps further, making the finals of the French open and will rise to number six in the world with that result. Nadal is up to number four. Uh, we'll shift over to the women's side. This one, you know, we were all very much aligned with who we were taking uh, to win this French Open title. I mean, how could you not take Iga Fiontek based on what she'd achieved uh, in the lead up to the French Open? Even prior to that, 28 match wins heading in. Now uh, she has brought that to 35 consecutive wins as she hoists her second career Roland Garros title, defeating Coco Goff in the final, a one-sided final and one-sided victory. And look, she she was dominant and ruthless throughout, almost as we expected. I think last week we talked about can you find a name who's going to stop her, and and we couldn't. Yes, Fiontech totally believing in herself, total confidence. You know, she mentioned she's gone from playing a more passive game to, on purpose, playing a more aggressive style. Coco Goff mentioned that, boy, she was just being attacked from everywhere on the court by, by Sviantec. And, uh, you know, who's going to take her down? At some point, she's bound to, to lose a match. Who's going to be able to do it? I don't feel like anyone on the women's tour right now feels that they're able to do that the way she's playing. Even when she lost that set in the, what was it, the fourth round to, to Zhang there in a tie break. She mm -hmm. then blitzed her 6-love and 6-2 to close that one out. So um, just playing remarkable tennis uh, in the aftermath of, of Ash Barty's retirement, uh, proving to be a very deserving number one. And ties Venus Williams, as I think you mentioned, with that 35th straight win, which is the most in the 21st century, so the most in the last 22 years on the women's side in terms of consecutive victories. But then when you compare it to all-time greatest women's win streaks, 
it's nothing. It's just a drop in the bucket because Martina Navratilova has the all-time record at 74 consecutive wins back in 1984. Graf had 66 once, 46 and 45 another couple times. Navratilova had a 58-match win streak. Everett had a 55-match win streak. Back in the 70s and 80s, I mean, this is my take on it, first of all, is those players were incredible. Yes. But also the women's field wasn't as strong then uh, as it was now. You know, you had maybe two, three, four awesome top-level players. And then there was a decided drop is how I remember watching the WTA back then. Whereas now, you know, after Sviantec, uh, there's a lot of players in there that are capable of, of putting things together. And uh, the depth on the women's tour, which you and me have talked about at length the past couple of years, you, you could almost see someone winning a slam from within the top 40 on the women's tour, and it wouldn't be a, a total shocker depending on who it was. So um, those numbers from the all-time greats are staggering. We'll see how far Sviantec can take this now as we switch from the clay to the grass. Yeah, and I, I think that change is where if the rest of the tour wants to knock her back and, and end this winning streak, now is the time. She's she's leaving her favorite surface. I think she's incredibly comfortable in hard courts as well, which we have seen. And the biggest surface change uh, that you have to adapt to on the tour is that change from the slow clay courts to the very fast, low bouncing grass. So uh, I think there's definitely some powerful names who could stop her on grass courts. Uh, we'll see what type of tennis, you know, a, a Kerber or Kvitova in terms of veterans are playing. Maybe Sabalenka finds her good form. It, it was a strange tournament in the sense that we didn't really see any of the other top 10 deliver. They all had surprising early round exits. And of course, we saw some some new names uh, emerge. And then a few familiar faces start playing great tennis again. Daria Kasakina was not a name I had really penciled to, to make a run here, but she makes her first ever uh, semifinal at a slam. She's been top 10 before. I think Jessica Pagula is playing great tennis now, but even still, she makes quarters and she loses three and two to Iga. Like <laughs> Iga's just blowing away the rest of the competition at this event. And then just to shift over to the Canadian angle, I think Layla Annie Fernandez has played a remarkably strong tournament. You look at that win she produced over Belinda Bencic. I thought that was fantastic. And we saw such uh, her victory over Anisimova as well in the fourth round. I thought that was one of the best matches of the tournament. And uh, unfortunately, I, I think an injury flare up really cost her in this quarters against surprise Italian Martina Trevisan, who she still pushed to three sets, but but we learned, and you could tell if you were watching that there was an issue with the foot uh, and she revealed a stress fracture a after that loss. So that was unfortunate of a, of a setback really and a missed opportunity to maybe make a semifinal or even final here. Yeah, you and I were maybe getting a bit ahead of ourselves a week ago. We were getting so excited by the prospect <laughs> yeah. of Fernandez in the semis and facing Coco Goff. That would have mm -hmm. been such an awesome match. No disrespect to Trevis and, you know, making her first semi, pretty awesome for her and her family and team. Uh, but for Layla Annie, uh, you know, we, we kind of, I don't want to say we forgot about, but just a reminder that you never know when injury is going to strike. Same with Zverev on the men's side. Something like that can happen in tennis. At any point in time, these athletes are pushing themselves so hard on the court. And uh, unfortunately for Fernandez, that I, I feel is, is what kind of did her in. Not to say she would have beat Iga in the final, but uh, I, I would have really enjoyed that semi against Coco. Would have loved to have seen her make another slam final. She won Roland Garros three years ago at the junior circuit at yep. the junior level in 2019. And now, unfortunately, this is going to keep her out of Wimbledon as well. So hopefully she can get healthy for the, the hard court swing. Um, you know, the National Bank opens not not that far away. We're talking about, what, two and a half months from now, not even just over two months from now. We're going to have the world's best here in Toronto, the women and the men in Montreal. And uh, of course, we want to see all of our Canadians healthy and ready to go. And that includes Leilani Fernandez. Gosh, maybe we can see Jeannie Bouchard back. Am I getting greedy by saying I'd love to see Milos back as well? I mean, can we just have them all in action at once? That would be fantastic. Um, so a couple more months to see what, what happens in, in that regard. But uh, no Layla Annie on grass at Wimbledon, unfortunately. Um, but we do have a host of other Canadian names that I think could put themselves in contention on the, uh, the lawns of Wimbledon. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, and I should say Jorge Fernandez uh, had an interview with Mark Masters of TSN after that Layla loss. And uh, he looked a bit emotional and distraught, just not only by the outcome, but by the fact that he has to sort of sit back in the stands and, and watch from afar and, and can't sort of 
bring any advice to the table of Layla, maybe you should stop. I think he had a great fear of her uh, further injuring uh, and worsening the foot and that she did play this three setter uh, when she was clearly injured. And I, I hope it didn't cause more problems with the foot. It's really incredible to me that she won that second set seven, six, like she was injured at that time and, and started. Took- yeah, and she took that tie break. Like that, her tie break was hers. Hey, eh? eh? like that. Oh was yeah, close. seven three. Yep, yep. And she started just redlining and cracking winners everywhere. I was thinking, oh my goodness, is she going to pull this off with, uh, you know, fracture in her foot? Obviously, we didn't know the the injury to her foot at that time, but uh, tremendous effort, really pushing Trevisan to to earn that victory in that quarter. So I, I hope the recovery is not too long. As you mentioned, she will miss Wimbledon. Certainly hopeful she'll be back in Toronto for the National Bank Open. Um, just one or two other storylines. Sloan Stevens, great to see her play so well again. I think we mentioned that last week, but making a quarterfinal here. She plays really well on the hard courts in North America, as we know, of course, winning the U.S. Open. We've seen her play well, I think, in Montreal, too. I'd love to see her at the National Bank Open uh, win some matches. That would be great to see. Yeah, me as well. And, and Sloan feels so comfortable in Toronto. It's kind of been like a home away from home because her partner, Josie Aldador, the uh, yep. soccer player uh, based in Toronto. I don't I don't think he's still playing for the Toronto team, is he? But uh, um, I don't. He was for quite some time, so. and so yeah. she was in town a lot. Actually, she'd be on the, the courts at Hotel X, 10XTO, just to drop that plug one more time, mm-hmm. um, staying there and, and practicing there. Uh, and, and Sloane Stevens, to me, aside from you know loving to watch her game when she's really uh, hitting her stride, she's great in press. She's so much fun in press conferences, so laid back, so willing to engage. Um, she had a good run in Toronto a couple summers ago, a few summers ago, and was just wonderful in press and really um, you know one of my favorites to talk to. So... Hopefully she's back and in a good mood. And um, hey, look, to wrap up Roland Garros, why don't we kind of reflect on some picks that you and I made for Tennis Canada, where they they, they call these these so-called expert picks. Look, I didn't pick that title, okay? But anyways, they threw us in the mix there. Uh, where did you go right? Where did you go wrong? And how do you feel overall about the picks you made this year? I, I honestly have to say I feel pretty good about these picks um, to successfully pick both the men's and women's champion. And look, everybody, I think, was on board with the Ega train. And how could you not be, as I said? So that one is is nothing to brag about. Uh, but but I was not that I was confident, but I picked uh, Rafael Nadal to win this title by virtue of his his storied record at Roland Garros. I just don't steer away from him at this tournament. And a lot of people had had their doubts that he could pull this off again. And once he picked up that win over Djokovic, um, I think the writing was on the wall that he was going to do this. So I got that correct. And then have to give myself a pat on the back for picking Coco Goff as my dark horse and seeing her make the semifinals. I think she plays great tennis on clay. She can play great on all surfaces. Uh, so I was right on the money there. My Canadian picks were not strong. I felt like Bianca had been playing well, loses to Bencic in the second round. And then I think the pick of Denis Shapovalov was a mistake. I saw him on the bottom half of the draw thinking he could go on a run, runs into Holgerun in the first round, plays pretty poorly and uh, exits. So there you go. Yeah, when I'm looking between the six of us that they asked for this, everybody picks Fiontek, so that was no surprise. The men's winners were split between Djokovic and Nadal. I was the only one, actually were two of us who went with Alcaraz. I mean, I feel like any of those picks, you know, it's almost a coin toss there. But Nadal, I mean, you can never go wrong with, with picking him. And then the best performing Canadian, I went, I was, was I the only one? I was the only one that went with the Fernandez, Felix, Oje, Aliassim combo. A lot of people were liking Bianca, but mm-hmm. I thought her draw was a little tough, especially with Benchich playing well on clay this lead in and Bianca still finding her form. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to Mark Masters. He went with Gabby Dabrowski as the best performing Canadian. And he was right, ultimately, if you include yeah. all the draws, as Gabby did make it to the semifinals in mixed doubles. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I, I should have... Uh put on my doubles cap as well as, as we as we filled out those brackets I almost uh, overlooked the doubles aspect and uh, good for Gabby as well to bounce back I think we had pretty high expectations for her and uh, Juliana almost in women's doubles that didn't work out they lost in the third round so for her to kind of bounce back immediately and mixed with uh, John Pierce and, and make the semis I, I still think that's a solid result and and Gabby's going to be the threat to go deep at any slam, right? I think that was a bit of a For blip. Sure. I don't know what quite transpired in that match. Didn't get the opportunity to watch it, but she had such a great clay court lead up. 
um, and her and, and Julianne are playing fantastically together, which is interesting because neither one of them are their usual partners. They're mm -hmm. both filling in, right? Juliana normally plays with Canadian Sharon Fishman, who uh, I know is back on court training. And Gabby is normally with um, uh, Louisa, Louisa Stefani, Stefani yeah. who suffered that uh, really bad leg injury at the U.S. Open last year, still hasn't come back. They were looking like one of the top women's doubles tandems at the time. So Gabby's really proving, I guess, that uh, she's good to go with, uh, with just about anybody. And, yep. a, and a true top 10 presence uh, on the women's doubles side of things. Um, and for, you know, I would say probably still years to come. So uh, Wimbledon, when it comes around for that, if they ask us for our expert picks, uh, maybe we should go both go with, with Gabby for that one and give her uh, credit where credit's due. Yeah, that, that could be a wise choice. And just hitting on grass for the moment, we know it's such a quick turnaround and an immediate surface change and players are already playing challengers on grass. I know uh, Andy Murray was playing a, a challenger on grass this this past week, making the semifinals. We have Canadians in action this week. Denis Shapovalov set to compete in Stuttgart. I, I sense he will very quickly want to forget about his result in Paris and uh, for me, grass might be his very best surface. We saw what he did at Wimbledon last year. Felix as well, very dangerous on the grass court surface. He's playing Hertogen Bosch this week, and I believe he is the top seed there. So, um, look, no no sleep for the wicked. Uh, quick turnaround here, and we're going to be watching uh, our next surface already on the tennis calendar. Hertogen Bosch, thank you. I'm yeah. always glad when you lead that one right away. There's a couple tough ones. But yeah, I'm stoked for grass court tennis. I really enjoyed the clay this year. I got to be honest, there were some fun storylines in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the men's side, it got a little bit more interesting too with how Alcaraz was performing. But grass court tennis for me is what, uh, you know, I fell in love with the sport uh, due to grass court tennis. And so I'm stoked for the lead up. Uh, very excited for Wimbledon. Uh, Going to definitely have some time off from uh, my day job to uh, watch a lot of those matches. And uh, yeah, we'll be bringing you all the action throughout the lead up to Wimbledon and that fortnight, hopefully get some great guests for you as well. So uh, Ben, I think for sp I speak for both of us when I say uh, we're, we're excited for what's next. And uh, thanks for sticking with us through the, the clay court swing this year. Yeah, thank you guys. We've essentially reached the halfway point uh, of the season and, and now ready for, for the next surface and next big tournaments. Guys, you've been listening to Matchpoint Canada. Our thanks to 10XTO, the official athletic club of Matchpoint Canada. We will talk to you next time.